my name is Marcus Holman, um, professional lacrosse player in the PLL, which is the Premier Lacrosse League. I play for Archers Lacrosse Club. I'm also an assistant coach at the University of Utah, go Utes, and I'm living out in Salt Lake City, Utah. And growing up in Baltimore, Maryland, lacrosse is everything there. I would say it's bigger than football, it's bigger than basketball. Um, you know, and, and it just was kind of a sport that I gravitated to when I was younger, I would say my dad was an assistant coach at Johns Hopkins, um, from, I think 1999 to 2001. So I was eight years old at the time and I grew up on the sidelines of arguably the most prestigious, uh, venue in college lacrosse, which is Homewood field where Johns Hopkins plays. So I was introduced to the sport that way firsthand. I was on the sideline. I was in the locker room with those college players. And I just remember at the time, those guys were like larger than life to me. Um, you know, they um, were big and they were strong. And, you know, there was eight, 9,000 people at these games. And I just remember like the environment being so um, incredible. And I was definitely drawn to that. Um, so that's kind of where my start um, I obviously, I love all sports. I played football and basketball in high school. Um, and if there's anything we can compete in, whether it's, you know, Frisbee golf or horseshoes or ping pong, like I, I, I just want to play it and, and try to compete and try to win. So, um, that's kind of how I grew up with, with the sport. Um, but yeah, it definitely, definitely runs in, in, in my family blood. My my journey as a professional lacrosse player has been has been fun. Um, I would say, like I like I said, I've always loved sports. Uh, we grew up big Baltimore Ravens fans. I'm still a big Baltimore Ravens fan. They're in the playoffs this Saturday. I'm really excited for it. Um, but yeah, I, I you know I think my dream was always to like play in the NFL. Um, and when I was younger, I was I was a pretty good football player. I was I would say I was just kind of solid across the board at three sports. I didn't stand out really in, in one above the other. Um, and then some adversity struck for me when I was in eighth grade in the spring, I was playing lacrosse and I got tangled up. I fell down and I broke my collarbone, broke my left collarbone. Um, sat out, came back probably eight or nine weeks later, which in hindsight was a little bit too early, got pushed, fell on it, broke it again. So now I broke my collarbone two times in the span of about two months. And this is leading into my summer before my freshman year. And I was changing schools. I was changing from boys Latin to Gilman in the Baltimore area with an emphasis on being a, a good football player. Gilman has an A conference football program. You know, I thought that that at the time was what I loved and that was going to be my path to college and then maybe the NFL. Um, and then after that second break, I sat out came back 10 weeks later and broke my collarbone a third time. So now I had broken my collarbone three times in a span of about six months. And at the doctor's recommendation, he said, we don't think you should play football this year. We think you should sit out any contact sport for another six months, um, which would take me through that fall season. And then I was allowed to play basketball as a freshman. So when football and really all sports got taken away from me, you know, I, I did have to do some reflection at, at a younger age. Um, and I think at that time, I realized that football probably wasn't going to be the path for me um, and that I should devote a little bit more of my interests, you know, getting ready for my freshman year of lacrosse. And so that was kind of a big shift for me. And then the other shift it did for me was it made me realize, and I think if anybody watches me play, this is kind of how I play the game. It's that I'm never going to take a playoff. I'm never going to take a second of any game off because I realized how quickly the game can be taken away from you, you know, and, and I'm just fortunate that it wasn't, you know, a career threatening injury. I was able to overcome it and knock on wood. This thing hasn't bothered me to this day. So um, yeah. So again, I, I kind of shifted my mind to lacrosse as a freshman. Uh, I was able to have a, a really solid career at, at Gilman um, we had some awesome teams there. We, uh, I think we went 35 and two my junior and senior years. We were able to win a, a high school championship, but 
you know, once I got to that point, I think as a freshman or sophomore, I was just like, you know, I think I want to play professional lacrosse. Like that became a dream of mine um, at that age. And at the time, professional lacrosse was not what it is today with the PLL. So I got some funny looks um, from some of my teammates or classmates that were like, you know, you can't make a living doing that. But in my head, I just said, you know, I want to compete and try to just continue to improve and, and play at the highest level. So that was a big shift for me. I would say that the support system is, is crucial. Um, you know, I mentioned my, my dad playing at uh, Johns Hopkins. I mean, he's, he's been my mentor, honestly, like he's an incredible father to not only me, but my older brother, Matthew and my younger sister, Sydney. Um, he's just a great dad. He's a great husband, but he, his specialty in life, I think is the ability to mentor and motivate young men. Um, right now he's the head coach at the university of Utah. So I'm able to work with him every day, you know, right after this podcast, we're going to go in, in his office and we're going to practice plan for our team today. And, um, it's just, it's, it's been a, a blessing to be able to work with him, but a little bit of a sidebar there, he was able to just kind of motivate me and keep my spirits up when, when I was going through that, um, you know, and I, I think there have been little moments along the way that, you know, that was probably the biggest piece of adversity I've gone through with my sport career. Um, but there's been other setbacks along the way. And I think you have a couple options when you're faced with adversity, right? You can kind of cower away from it. You can ignore it. You can kind of blame other people and make excuses about why things aren't going wrong. Maybe your coach benched you you know, and you can point the finger at the coach or you can, you know, start talking and gossiping about other players on your team, or you can just kind of face it head on and be honest with yourself about the situation that's happening. Okay. I got injured. I've, I've got to sit out two weeks of practice. I'm going to miss two games. Okay. How can I attack this rehab and be able to put my body in a great position to come back healthy? And maybe it's, sacrificing some ice cream maybe it's sacrificing some alcohol you know it's it's making those little tweaks maybe i get to bed 30 minutes earlier um and kind of just devising a plan in in terms of that way um because i think the the biggest inhibitor of young athletes and college athletes is just feeling sorry for yourself um because at the end of the day and and uh, you know this has been a process for me about mental training and mental growth like no one really cares you know, no one cares about you. Like you're, you're lucky if you have a family that supports you and cares about you. But at the end of the day, the other players on the team, they want to compete. They want to start, you know, the coach is going to play the best player and the, the player who has the best attitude. So if you're feeling sorry for yourself and, and you're not showing up to practice with a great attitude, like you're just putting yourself at a, at a disadvantage. So I, I do think there were times where I had rough days, but, you know, I look back on that time and you know, it's, it's a cool kind of part of my story. And um, again, there have been other setbacks along the way. I think I look back to this season in the PLL where I, you know, this was my eighth year playing professional lacrosse and I probably struggled the most this, this season in our PLL tournament. Um, and, you know, it was tough. I wasn't used to not playing well. I'm used to scoring a lot of goals and, and helping my team win. And, we were winning, but I really felt like I, I wasn't unleashing my full potential. So, you know, this off season, I've, I've been honest about my weaknesses. I've been trying to improve on them. And um, while also maintaining confidence, you know, and, and understanding that, you know, I am one of the best attackmen in the world. Like I have proven that over the past seven, eight years, like, and I just kind of have to get back to being myself. And, um, you know, so I'm excited for this upcoming PLL season is kind of what that leads into. <laughs> it has been really cool to just see the growth of, of professional lacrosse over the past 10 years. Um, you know, I came out of college in, in 2013 and we lost a playoff game on a Sunday and I played my first professional game on that Thursday. So it was like this, you know, my career was over. I was devastated. We had a really tough loss to, to Denver in the quarterfinals. And then I had to play my first ever game for the Ohio machine. Um, and, 
you know, moving forward with the machine, I had an incredible career with them. Um, we I had some of the greatest teammates I, I've ever played with, and we were able to win a championship in, in 2017, which was one of the highlights of, of my career. Um, but just on a more kind of broad scale, you know, my rookie salary for the for Major League Lacrosse was six thousand um, dollars. So coming out of college, I was kind of at a crossroads. Like I knew I wanted to play. Um, but once that season was over, you know, I barely had any money in my bank account. I didn't know what I wanted to do for a career. And it was actually at my father's urging that I stick with lacrosse. Um, I was living in, in Chapel Hill at the time where I went to college. I was able to do lesson, private lessons and travel and do clinics kind of all across the country um, and make a living. And it was his, his urging that I stick with lacrosse and that I keep training in an effort to try and make the 2014 USA national team. So lo and behold, I, I trained really, really hard for that. I ended up making that team as a, you know, 23 year old. Uh, I think I was one of the youngest guys on the team. And my first experience kind of with international lacrosse was traveling to Denver for the 2014 world championships. And that really opened my eyes to how many countries play this sport, you know, how much, the brotherhood of lacrosse is really, it's not just, you know, in Baltimore or Long Island or Philadelphia, the hotbeds, it's really a global thing. Um, meeting players from Argentina, you know, meeting players from England, meet, meeting players from, you know, Spain. And, and it really was, was a cool feeling to be a part of that team. Um, even though we ended up getting silver and, and losing to Canada, but, you know, that kind of opened my eyes again to, to, to see that lacrosse is an international sport. Um, you know, being able to be on Team USA in, in 2014 and 2018 for these world championships has, has just been such a blessing for me. Like, obviously, it's something that I really worked hard for. And, and you know, to be able to be selected as, you know, a top 23 player in the country is, is really special. But I'll never forget in 2014, we were walking, we got off the bus, I think we were getting ready to play Japan, maybe. And we're walking to our field. And um, the location where they had the event, there were a bunch of smaller fields. So all these teams can play, right? And we passed China versus Uganda. And there were maybe 500 people on the sideline. It was the most rowdy lacrosse game I've ever seen. The sidelines were going crazy. Guys were cheering for each other. The effort these teams were putting forward was incredible. And just like seeing that spirit of lacrosse was, was really, really special and powerful for me, as I mentioned earlier, but, you know, I think we're seeing, um, you know, countries like Australia have a really strong lacrosse community. I think England is growing um, in the UK and in, in their lacrosse presence uh, on a global stage. Japan is a country that has just absolutely fallen in love with the sport of lacrosse and has some really, really good players. We, we scrimmaged them, I think maybe a year and a half ago with Team USA, and I think they were either beating us or it was tied at halftime. You know, so these teams are are improving. And I think just the presence of lacrosse on the international stage has has really improved. And I think the Premier Lacrosse League is doing a great job of just trying to not be a national brand, but be a global brand. You know, I, th I think leadership is, is everything. And it's something that I personally pride myself on. Um, you know, and I think it's, it's half and half. I think it's something that comes naturally to people. And I think the other half of it is that leadership is a choice. It's a choice you make to put yourself out there. Um, it's a choice you make to sacrifice some things, you know, maybe it's sacrificed being liked, you know, it's, 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 um, it's a choice you make to, you know, be in communication with the coaching staff, whatever level you're at, whether it's high school, college, or even professional, um, you know, because you do have to be that liaison between the, the staff and the players. Um, but I also think it is the most rewarding part about being a teammate or playing on a team. Um, you know, I think, I think back to when I was younger, I always kind of just gravitated towards the front of the line, um, whether it was, you know, running laps around the track, or it was, um, you know, guys lining up to 
the lunch or whatever it was, I just kind of found myself always gravitating towards the front. And as I grew, um, I realized that, you know, not everybody was like that, you know, it was kind of, I, I was a little bit different in that realm. So, um, I've always, you know, prided myself on just being passionate and, you know, caring about my teammates, um, and really just, you know, giving it my all every time that I'm, I'm on the practice field and, um, I'm on the game field. So I think leadership is two parts, right? It's, it's your actions and then it's, it's the vocal piece of it too, you know? And I think some people think that the vocal part is more important and it's not, you know, I think there's a lot of leaders that talk and say a lot of the right things, but what are you actually doing behind the scenes to help your team get better? You know, are you reaching out to the 48th guy on the depth chart? And are you making sure that he feels valued as a, as a team member? Um, because if he does, he's going to come out to the practice field. He's going to give his best effort every day and he's going to make the 47th guy better. And then the 47th guy is going to be like, Oh dang. And he's going to push the guy in front of him. So at the collegiate level, that's how I felt about my leadership. I was trying to keep my team motivated. Um, I was trying to be the guy that was doing the right things, you know, on and off the field. Um, I was trying to, to win every sprint, you know, just to set that example that, you know, when we come back from Christmas break, I'm in shape and I'm ready to go. Um, so I, I think I've, I've, that was kind of how I approached leadership in college. And then as you grow, I think in the professional ranks, it changes a little bit. You know, I think where we're at right now with professional lacrosse, we don't practice every day. Um, you know, our season is, is kind of a brief three month span where we, um, get together on the weekends and we're trying to, you know, create as much team chemistry as we can in that short amount of span, but we have a really long off season, you know, and I think, it's important to keep in touch with people. It's important to just check in on your teammates um, every now and then. And then when it comes to gameplay, right, it's at the professional level, it doesn't have to be like major rah-rah speeches. You know, I still like to get in the huddle and, and get guys fired up. Um, I think there are some guys that listen to me. I'm sure some guys are, are a little bit more tuned out than your, your college team was. But um, like I said, it's, it's, a, it's a choice to kind of step up and, and, and say, Hey, this is the culture that we want to create. You know, I, I care about you. You know, I want us to win. I don't care about my personal stats. You know, I want to play well so that we win. Um, and just making that clear to the guys around you. My favorite quote is, is a quote from Anson Dorrance, who was a women's soccer coach at the University of North Carolina. Um, he was driving to his office one morning at 5 a.m. And he saw Mia Hamm out working on drills. You know, anybody who knows Mia Hamm, she's probably the most famous women's soccer player of all time. Maybe one of the most famous soccer players of all time, let alone women. And he went to his office and he wrote her a note. And he said, the vision of a champion is someone who's bent over, drenched in sweat to the point of exhaustion when nobody's watching. And I read that quote. I'm not sure when I did, um, but for me, the piece of advice is that, you know, when nobody's watching, what are you doing? Um, and that's obviously related to the work that you're putting in, um, you know, the push-ups, the sit-ups, the stretching, the shooting reps. Um, but it's also related to, to your off the field actions. You know, what, do, you know, when nobody's watching, what are you doing? You know, are you being uh, a man of integrity or a woman of integrity? Um, so that always drove me. I think my, my biggest, growth as a player has just come on my own when I was out in the yard shooting lacrosse balls until I would literally just lay down and take a nap in our yard <laughs> when it was really nice um, when I was a, a younger player so um, you know having that work ethic has has propelled me like there's no secret about it you, you've got to work hard if you want to achieve the highest levels of goals you you have to have some talent for sure I was definitely born with some natural athletic ability but I've never been you know, the most talented player on my team, probably since my freshman year of high school. Uh, and, and, you know, I, I just have that mindset that I, I have to work for everything that I get. Um, some guys are, are more fortunate and they don't have to work as hard, I think. And, and that's just the way it is. And I'm okay with that. But um, so that's always just kind of, I've kind of just prided myself on that in, in my career. Um, 
the other, you know, another, another piece of advice for, for a younger player goes back to leadership is that, you know, um, have some courage to, to stand out, um, to, to try and be a leader, you know, to, to galvanize your teammates because it makes the experience so much more enjoyable. Um, you know, the, the, the best teams that I've been a part of um, have been super close, you know, they've been together um, and they've really taken a lot of pride in the fact that they care about one another and they're willing to go out and compete super, super hard for the goal of winning. Um, so I would say have some courage. Courage is a big word that I've, I've just found coming up in the past couple of years and, and how I want to coach kids um, and how I want to impact them. You know, it, it, it takes courage to stand up and tell your teammate to stop picking the ground ball up with one hand. You know, it takes courage um, to do the right thing every day when, you know, it, it might be a little bit easier to kind of take the path of, of least resistance. Um, you know, it takes courage to um, walk up to a girl and maybe ask for her phone number, you know, it, it so it, that's, again, goes back to kind of teaching those life lessons through um, lacrosse, which, which can translate. You know, I think, like I said, this year has been filled with reflection, you know, and at a point where, you know, college campuses were struggling and sports were shutting down and, you know, am I going to have a job this spring? Were, they were all thoughts that I was having kind of back in the fall or even last summer. Um, you know, I, I think we never know what's ahead of us, right? I don't know what, what could happen tomorrow. Um, you know, I do know that lacrosse is a, is a big piece of my life. Um, I do feel like I have three, four, maybe five years left of, of a professional career where I can impact the team and, and score a lot of goals and be a, a really dynamic attackman for, for a team. You know, right now it's the archers and hopefully I'm an archer for the rest of my career. So that's one piece of it, right, is, is training, um, is stretching, mobility, like keeping my body healthy to be able to play at a high level for the next couple of years. And then, you know, right now I'm, I'm very, very happy with my coaching situation at the University of Utah. I really enjoy our players. Uh, I love coaching with my father and, and our other assistant coaches, Will Manny, who's a teammate of mine, and Adam Gittleman, who's also a teammate of mine. You know, we, we do have a little brotherhood out here. Um, and I think we, we work well together as, as a coaching staff. Um, you know, I, I'm really, I love living out here in, in Utah. And um, so I think it allowed me to kind of sit back and realize that those, those pieces of my life are like stable, you know, and, and I'm able to make a living doing what I love. Like I was just telling my fiance the other night, like, I just feel so grateful every day. <laughs> I'm able to wake up and walk out on a practice field and and just dive into that you know and I think any coach will tell you or any player will tell you when you hit that flow state where I'm out on the practice field and it's just time you know like just flies by or time actually slows down because I'm just so engaged with the moment and um you know I think those those moments as a coach I didn't realize that you could have them as a coach I thought it was only reserved for players you know when you get in the zone and I've had games where I've scored six goals. I've had a game where I scored 11 goals and, you know, it's just like everybody else is moving in slow motion. You know, I thought that was just reserved for players, but you can actually find it as a coach too, or you can find it in your everyday job. If you're just totally present in the moment, um, you know, and engaged with, with everything that's going on around you. So again, kind of a long winded answer. I, I feel like I'm, I've been hanging around my dad too much because he, he's, he's pretty good at, at those, but um I'm, I'm happy with my situation. I want to be involved with the lacrosse community as, as long as I can. And it is a special place. And, um, you know, I'm just grateful for this game. Thanks for tuning in, everyone. And thank you to the Premier Sports Network. I had a really fun interview this morning and hopefully enjoy the uh, journey of my lacrosse career and my life. See ya.